Hello there guys, welcome back to Upper Reach and to our wonderful live stream wine tasting. So thank you so much for joining me again. Um, today we're going to be talking about Chardonnay. Now, for those who know me, I absolutely love Chardonnay. Like, it is my favourite varietal. I think it is just the absolute bee's knees. Now, the Chardonnays I've got for you today here from Upper Reach, I have our unwooded style to show how fresh and vibrant they can be. I also have a young oak Chardonnay, so our reserve Chardonnay that we put a lot of effort and just all of our passion into. Um, we also have an aged oak chardonnay, which I am seriously looking forward to. Now today I'm going to split it into three sections once again. Um, I'm going to start off with a bit of a background about chardonnay. Now I'm going to have to be really careful with this because in all honesty I could speak for over an hour about chardonnay and I don't want to bore you. So I'm going to split it into just pretty much the grape varietal itself, like how it's so malleable and just how just easy to work with it is. Um, and then going to move on to um, pretty much all of the winemaking processes that make big styles of Chardonnay really unique and special and create such great food features for the wines. Um, honestly, yeah, I absolutely adore Chardonnay, so I'm, I'm just gonna have fun talking about this. So. Um, after that, I'm going to go on to our wonderful tasting of these three wines, the Unwooded Chardonnay, the Reserve Chardonnay, and the Museum Release. Um, I'll talk tasting notes, the profile, so the nose, the palate, that kind of thing, and also throw in more food pairings as well. Um, once we've gone through the wines, that's when I'd love to hear some questions, because Chardonnay has such, like, it's got such mixed reviews. It's such a polarizing um, wine. And yeah, it would be great to hear from people who like don't think Chardonnay is their thing, people who believe in like anything but Chardonnay. Um, it'd be great to also hear from people like me who absolutely love those big, rich, buttery drops. So I'm really looking forward to the end, guys. So please stay with me. Um, do hope you're all staying safe out there as well. I'm really glad to be keeping you company, so I think I shall begin. Now, Chardonnay is one of the most widely planted varietal in the world. It is absolutely everywhere. I'm talking France, I'm talking the US, like I'm talking most of Europe, and anywhere you can grow wine, you can find Chardonnay. Now, Pretty much, like it came to Australia in the 1920s, but only really gained popularity in the 70s. Um, it's just a really fun variety to work with. Now, when I'm talking, when we're growing it, it's a very, it's very flexible in where it can grow. It can grow in quite warm climates, so warm Mediterranean climates like our own, or it can grow in really cool climates. And the different flavor profiles you get from those climates are absolutely staggering. They're like two completely different wines. So you can have one that's really like peachy and stone fruity, and then you can have another one from a cooler climate that's really grassy and grippy and acidity and just, yeah, very clean and refreshing. So we're gonna talk about how, first off, how much of a malleable grape varietal it is. Now, it really takes on what happens around it in its growing conditions. So if you're growing it in a hot region, like I just mentioned, you're going to get more tropical fruit character or more stone fruit. Whereas if you grow it cooler, you're going to get more sort of citrus, herbaceous characters, and they're very, very different. It's a great little thing to have. Other things that affect Chardonnay as a varietal as well, obviously, um, the soil that it's in. So different types of soil. We've got quite sort of silt rich soil here. So ours is quite special for that. Um, chalk, limestone, all of these different types of soil really impact on the flavor and the texture of the wine. So it's a really, it's so much fun to play around with. Um, out there as well now, it is something like a lot of wine writers really say that Chardonnay is the wine that really, it's the most impressionable about what happens around it. So 
I'm talking sort of the aspect of the land, like the typography, like if it's hilly, which side of which slope is facing where, how much sun it gets, if it's close to a water source, all of these things are super important for determining what your Chardonnay on your own land is going to be like. And if you want any further proof that like just one varietal, like you should never say like, okay, I don't drink Chardonnay, I don't drink Shiraz, I don't drink this. If you want one varietal that you should give a go of and try and break that, it's Chardonnay because every single vineyard that you go to makes a different style. It, it starts off with different grapes because it is so malleable and fun to work with and it takes up so much of the character of the land. So I urge anybody out there, I know there are so many rich and buttery listeners right now, but for all the people who just looked in and you normally say anything but Chardonnay, I urge you to try an unwooded Chardonnay. I urge you to try some of the ones that are coming out of the Swan Valley and Margaret River. Western Australian Chardonnays have never been better. So now's the time to stop saying ABC. Um, after pretty much the vineyard stuff and growing the grapes, when it's in the winery, this is where the winemaker has literally a blank canvas to do whatever he wants with it. It's such a fun one to play with. And like, the three things that I'm going to quickly mention are oak and how it's made. The next one will be a process called malolactic fermentation. And then the third one is lees stirring. Now, those three really impact the character of a complex Chardonnay. So I'll start off with oak. So. Oak barrels are made by people who are called coopers. Um, they're the people who source the oak from their regions, and they cut them into strips, they turn them into those barrels that you see, um, and they make sure that they're watertight, that they are toasted, and they make sure that everything is just a perfect vessel for a winemaker to put his stamp on wine. Now, oak barrels, like a lot of people don't realize, they're actually burnt on the inside, um, there are plenty of great videos online about how wine barrels are made. I urge you to have a look at it because it is really cool. Um, and I'm not saying that just as a nerd, it is just very, very cool. <laughs> so, um, all of the, yeah, so just wine barrels in themselves, they are just so, um, oh, they are, what's the word for it? Um, they're porous. That's the word. It finally came to me. No pressure, Steve. Um, so it's porous, and that means that basically all the, like, wine is made up of a lot of water. Now, water is going to evaporate through there, and the wine itself is going to oxidize. Now, when this happens, the wine gets more of a rich texture, um, and it starts to really become more full-bodied, and it builds character in the wine. Um, and oak barrels are different how old they are as well. So if you're putting wines into new French oak barrels, you're going to get more of a toasty, smoky, vanillin, coconutty kind of character to the wine. Um, whereas if you're putting them in older oak, so you can reuse oak barrels. Um, if you're putting them in older oak, you're not going to get as much of that toastiness that you would. So if you like your really big, toasty like struck match like smoky chardonnays look for wines that have been in new french oak unfortunately they are going to be a bit pricey as well because new barrels are unbelievably expensive they're horrible like we're talking between sort of like like 800 to 2000 dollars a barrel and it's just that in turn affects the cost price for us and therefore they've become much more expensive. So our Chardonnay, for instance, goes a third, well, a quarter of it goes into brand new French oak, a quarter into one-year-old oak, a quarter into two-year-old oak, and a quarter into three-year-old. Now, what that does is it balances the toastiness that you get from the new oak, and it retains the fruit purity from the, um, from the grapes that have come in from the vineyard. So it's a great little way to get Chardonnay that's very well balanced. Um, going back to oak as well, there are lots of different places that you can get oak from. Here at Upper Reach, we use all French oak because it gives a very soft vanillin character to the wine. And it just makes 
everything a lot more sort of rich and toasty. So, and that's something that I just love in a wine. Um, when we're talking about pretty much how long um, wines generally go into oak barrels for, um, our Chardonnay goes in for nine months, um, whereas a lot of different places, they're going to be, um, they're really going to sort of put them in for a lot longer. And if you've got older oak barrels and you want to put them into, put your wine into older oak barrels, you're going to need a lot longer in those barrels generally, um, just if you want to have that toasty, buttery character to them. Um, the next thing that I will talk about is a bit of a mouthful. So this one is malolactic fermentation, whereas technically it should be malolactic conversion, but I guess it didn't have the ring to it. It should be conversion because you're not actually fermenting sugar into something. Like you're actually converting one type of acid into another type of acid. Now this happens after fermentation. So with malolactic fermentation, you've got two different types of acids that you're working with. So originally in the fully fermented Chardonnay, um, you have malic acid. Now, this is a natural acid that you generally find in things like green apple. And then what we're going to do, we're going to convert it into lactic acid, which we find in milk. Now, the cool thing with this is it's the same amount of acidity, but your brain is perceiving that there's a different kind of acidity and you recognize that as being creamy. So that's why we have creamy, buttery, um, all of those kind of descript descriptions for Chardonnay. So it's like such a cool little process and like, yeah, I just think it's just fabulous. Like I, I love big buttery Chardonnay, so I like my, I like my Chardis to be lots of new French oak like pretty close to full mallow. Like it's very argued at the moment because that's the old style of Chardonnay that used to get a really bad rep. So it's just kind of, yeah, like they used to be like drinking liquid wood. That's the only way, I could, like chewing on the end of a pencil, that kind of thing. And winemakers really wanted to move away from that and like, here in the Swan Valley and down in Margaret River as well, um, people are doing a lot of partial malolactic fermentation and that really makes for things with good acidity but it's still quite soft and robust and smooth. So honestly, some of the best Chardonnay in the world is coming out of Western Australia now. So if you're local, even if you're over east, I urge you to order in some Chardonnay because this is the best place you're gonna get it from now. Um, next up, we will be talking about something called lees stirring. Now this is happening during fermentation um, while they're in the barrels. Now lees are spent or dead yeast cells. Now what these yeast cells do, they fall to the bottom of the tank, or of the bottom of the barrel, sorry, um, and they just sort of sit there. And there's only so much character and flavour you can get from that thin surface. So if you were to put like a little metal rod in there and give it a stir, it clouds up in the barrel and all of that like yeast kind of has like a sort of bready, toasty, briochey character to it. And it really infuses into the character of a wine. So like, again, if you like my style of Chardonnay, you need some lees stirring with it as well. Um, lees stirring is also super important in sparkling wine, but I will mention that not next week, but the week after. So the next thing I think we should talk about is the most important part. We should get on to tasting. So I hope you have all of your bottles ready um, and I think we should dive in. So let's get these poured. So we're going to start off with the unwooded Chardonnay. Now this, as you can see, it's not one of those traditional yellow like Chardonnays at all that you rem remember from the sort of like yeah, from the past, and like, it's very, very different. You can see that. It's very similar to a Vidello, to a, to a sort of, yeah, it's just unwooded. It's fresh, it's light, it's easy. So, next one, let's pour the reserve Chardonnay. Actually, I've not poured them equally. That's a bit of a problem. There we go. And then, 
This one is my baby. This is amazing. So 2013 Reserve Chardonnay. Guys, this is easily the best and the toastiest Swan Valley made Chardonnay that you can find. It's as simple as that. Trust me on that. I'm a big Chardonnay drinker and this is my favorite. So what I'm gonna do first off, I want to show you, well I'll try and show you, the difference in the colour. And I'll do it because there's a hell of a difference between those two. Look at that. This is the unwooded Chardonnay and this is the aged museum. Now what happens there is pretty much, so oak is going to give a little bit of colour to the um, to the wine, um, but also oxidation. And when a wine ages, it also develops colour. And red wines, funnily enough, are the opposite. They lose colour over time. But yeah, it's amazing that you can see the differences between those three. But let's crack on. Let's try the first Chardonnay. Um, I hope we've all got this at home. This is the 2019 Unwooded Chardonnay. Um, I did actually just have a taste of the 2020, the Gig Unwooded Chardonnay. We're going back to the Gig, which will be great. Um, and that was beautiful, really, really yummy. So let's give it a sniff and let's see what we can find. Ooh, really nice sort of green apple and like lemon character to it. There's like a kind of, like a, like a mandarin and like a, a sherbet-y character to it as well. Ooh. Yeah, that is a really fresh, like the only way I can describe this wine is just a fruit salad in a glass. Like if, if you put your nose in a fruit salad just after pouring some orange juice over it, that's what I'm smelling right now, so. That is a beautiful little drop. Just perfect if you're just wanting something light, easy. It's the Chardonnay for non-Chardy drinkers. Like, I urge you, if you normally avoid Chardonnay like the plague, I want you to try this wine because I will prove you wrong. So, it'll be really good. Well, let's give it a taste and let's see what the acidity and the flavor profile's like. Once again, I am spitting. Don't try this at home. That's beautiful. It's just amazing how different that is to those oaky styles of Chardonnay. And my mouth is watering, the acidity is really fresh. I'm getting much more of the sort of the nectarine, like mandarin. Definitely that green apple is still around, it's beautiful. Um, oh, that is such a yummy little wine. I'll take another sip. I urge you to do this at home as well. I hope you're enjoying. That's really refreshing. And in all honesty, like generally oaky Chardonnays tend to be more of a drink now style of wine. Now, I mean, if you wanted to age it, you could, but I think if I had a choice between the reserved Chardonnay and the unwooded Chardonnay, I would take the obvious choice of aging the reserved Chardonnay. Like you need an oaky, you need an oaky style wine to really develop character over time. Whereas with sort of medium acidity, I'd say that's a nice medium acidity unwooded Chardonnay. Um, it tends to turn a little bit flabby and it loses its fruit purity over time. So I urge you to just enjoy this unwooded Chardonnay in its youth and just to have yeah, have it at a barbecue, take it out on the lawn, like cheeky illegal drinking on the beach, just don't get caught. So the next thing that I will go on to, oh actually food pairing. Um, for me the unwooded Chardonnay, I think like shellfish, I'm thinking like prawns on the barbecue, nothing too intense, you need something quite delicate because this is quite a delicate flavoured wine. Um, so I'd say anything like, like prawns, shellfish, just 
nice creamy sauce perhaps as well, but I'd save creaminess for these two Chardonnays though, the reserves. Um, speaking of, let's kick into them. So I'm going to start off with the 2019. So now this is normally, this is quite young for our normal style of of, of our Chardonnay, but the thing is, it's just so good. We can't make enough of it. So it just flies out the door. So need to get your hands on it or we're gonna have to find a way to make more of it because it is absolutely gorgeous. Do try and keep it back for a couple of years as well. Um, let's give this a smell. Now this is when you're going to really get the oak instantly, so. That's a, that's a happy boy here. I love my toasty, oaky wines. Everyone who knows me out there will know that I'm having a really good time right now. So, let's give it a... Mm. There's like a sort of burnt caramel note to it as well. It's just so toasty and rich. It's still got a great amount of acidity as well. There's also like... There's so much fruit purity with this as well. Like we're talking kind of like, yeah, just like that stone fruit. And also there's, there's something that's kind of on the tip of my tongue. Yeah, like cafe lime leaves, something like that. There's something, there's something there with, yeah. I'd say like for me, white peach, cafe lime leaf, there's toast, there's sort of butterscotchy character to it as well. Um, toast and a beautiful soft vanillin character as well. Now let's see what happens because the unwooded Chardonnay here, that doesn't go through malolactic fermentation, um, whereas the reserved Chardonnays, they do. So let's see if there's a difference in the acidity. Already that's much softer for me. Um, I don't know about you with your ones, but I, my mouth isn't watering quite as much as with that, and that's a great detection for acidity. Oh, that is so nice. And like, the one thing you'll notice with between the two of those wines, the Reserve Chardonnay, it's hanging around a lot longer. It's, I'm still tasting it, and I, like, that's over like 20 seconds again, so. That's the thing I love about Chard like oaky Chardonnays. Like, you can't find that flavor anywhere else. Like, it's only in oak Chardonnays. It's kind of like truffle in a way, like with how unique the flavor is. So, I'm going to have another sip. <laughs> that is, yeah, that's beautiful. I mean, that is going to be exceptional in a few years time. Like with these oaky Chardonnays, like we tasted a 2006 one last year. So we're talking, oh, hello Indy. <laughs> There's a new highlight. <laughs> but um, we tasted a 2006 Chardonnay and that was absolutely gorgeous. That still had good acidity to it. It was really rich and soft. So I think this one could go for easily over 10 years. This is the 2019, drink it in 2029 or 2035. God, that sounds like a long way away. <laughs> it doesn't, well, that's, that's a strange thing. Um, next up, now for all you lucky boys and girls out there with this wine, the Museum 2013 Reserve Chardonnay, you're in for a treat. If you haven't got it, I'm sorry, I will describe it as well as I can, and I hope to see you in the week. So, let's give this a smell. Now, 2013, what does that make it? Seven years old. So, this one is one year old, one year old, seven years old. I'm just back, hello, back, hello. Ah, that's what I'm talking about. Oh, I'm a happy boy. This is lovely. This is just beautiful. Oh, oh 
I forgot to do the nose. <laughs> That's how much I love this wine. So let's have a little sniff, of course. Just all of those toasty, buttery, um, just butter toast and butterscotch. Like all of those really rich, warm, like they sort of warm the inside of your tummy. Like all of those are so much more brought to the front when you have an oak chardonnay that's been aged. Like this, this is the white that will keep you warm in winter. Like it's absolutely beautiful. Um, it still has a lot of fruit character to it as well. Like that, the sort of white peach is more just your normal pink peach at the moment, so it sort of develops a little bit more. Oh, Indy's back, she's kind of wondering what I'm up to, but I will, I will carry on. Um, so, pretty much, the thing that I'm noticing here with this wine is that it has become a lot more rich and it tastes much more full to me. It's just, and it's starting to get that real characteristic like marzipan kind of note to it as well. Now when we tried the 2006 uh, Reserve Chardonnay, that one really got, really had a bit too strong a marzipan character for my personal liking, but this one, it's just right. This is beautiful. So let's have another taste, and I am not spitting this out. Guys, treat yourself. You must go and get some of this Museum Chardonnay. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, all three of the Chardonnays are great. I just, I do really adore Chardonnay and I'm very, very proud of all of the, of Western Australian Chardonnay. It's becoming world class and it's just doing wonderfully. Like, I think, and let's talk food pairings actually, because I will forget that. Um, as I mentioned, beautiful prawns with the, um, with the unwooded Chardonnay, prawns, shellfish, that kind of thing. Um, with the reserved Chardonnay, now I'm wanting something that's quite full, quite a real powerful flavour. Um, I would go, I mean, we've been talking about it all week, truffle risotto. It's as simple as that, you need some truffle risotto. We do a great Ogilvy's um, truffle risotto that you can get online or you can come in and collect. It's so easy to make, like just get some broth together, like it's just beautiful. So really, really great. Um, definitely truffle risotto with that. If you chop up some chicken and pop that in there, I definitely recommend that too. Um, with the Museum Chardonnay, I mean, it's such a great wine. I. I feel like it needs a really like rich and over the top kind of meal to it as well. So I'm thinking like like truffle butter on like on like crayfish or like lobster or something like that. That would just be like oh like you'd have my heart straight away with that. So but I think we should go on to my favorite section and see what you guys have as questions. So do Pop around, let me just have a little look. Oh. So Erna, you've got the 2015, you lucky thing. Oh, Tina as well. <laughs> Loving the sesh. <laughs> oh, wonderful. I know the color difference between the two is amazing. <laughs> Oh, it's very kind of you to say, Tina. <laughs> Let's have a little look. Oh, that's perfect. So can we age the 2013 longer? Naomi, great question. In all honesty, that's still got some great acidity. I think this wine, oh yeah, I'm not using this anymore. Not for the 2013. That acidity is still there, so I think that easily another three to five years. Um, it is just, that is just a stunning little wine. I think um, 
Yeah, I'd say another three to five years. That would be my kind of projection, but I mean, having tasted the 2006, it can go well further than that. So for me, if you want to be safe and you don't want a Chardonnay that's going to be a little bit too much, then yeah, I'd say the five, oh, five to seven, I'm gonna up it. Let's have a little look. Hello, Linda. Are all of these wines lees stirred? And what age of the barrels were they in? Great question, I love it. Um, the unwooded Chardonnay 2019, that doesn't go through lees stirring. We just let that go through as usual. The 2019 Reserve Chardonnay, that does go through lees stirring. Um, and that goes into, let me have a little look. Sorry, your questions just disappeared. And the age of the barrels for the 2019, um, we use a quarter one, uh, new French oak, a quarter one year old, a quarter two year old, and a quarter three year old. So just to have that toastiness and balance it with the fruit purity. And it's the same for the 2013. So I'm um, best mention as well, the 2019 and the 2013 have been made in exactly the same way. So really the, um, Really, the 2013 is a snapshot if you were going to keep the 2019 for a while. So let's have a little look. Thank you so much for that, Linda. That's a great question. Oh, Jan, I want to be at yours. She is enjoying the 2009 Chardonnay and it could still like last longer. Um, that is absolutely, yeah, I'm very, very jealous and I must try and see if we can have some of that. Let's see. Could you go with a red meat for the Chardonnay? Now that is a great question. Um, in all honesty, when it comes to uh, food pairings, you really want to match something that has a lot of flavor as a wine with a full flavored dish. Now, Chardonnay has got a really rich full flavor. Um, in all honesty, like I, I wouldn't be shy of pairing a Chardonnay with like a steak that has truffle butter on it, or any kind of buttery sauce on a red meat. I think those would go beautifully together. And pork as well. Pork is an incredible one for Chardonnay to go with, even though that's kind of like white meat. But yeah, I think those two would be a great way of doing it as well. Um, I have actually heard recently of somebody pairing um, Chardonnays with kangaroo, like grilled kangaroo. So I haven't tried it yet. I can't, I can't swear by it or swear against it. So I think that's something that we should try. Now let's have another little look. That is a great question, Daniel. Thank you for that. Hello, Kim, lovely to hear from you. Oh, better than the French vineyards. Now that is a wonderful compliment, so thank you. You've managed to capture the maturity after such a short period in business. Thank you, we really appreciate that. Laura and Derek always love those. Let's see. Ah, Peter, where have we been hiding the 2013? Well, I'll give you a call tomorrow and I'll make sure that you get some. Like, Pretty much the 2013, it's a members only wine and you're a member. We need to get some to you. <laughs> and then the truffle butter on the steak. Oh, I'm glad that you enjoyed that one. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, Bryce, you are testing me now. What is the difference between a Swan Valley Chardonnay versus a Margaret River Chardonnay? Well, first off, you can't find as many Swan Valley Chardonnays as you can Margaret River, so there's a bit of uniqueness there. Um, in all honesty, if you like... So, Margaret River Chardonnays have a wonderful reputation worldwide. They have worked tirelessly to get that across. Now, when you think of the Swan Valley, like, we're all family-owned. We, like, we look sort of... We look to our neighbours, in a way, and we make the wines that we want to share. And we really want to share all of these great wines as well. So I think the main difference for me between, it's really climate. So I think all of the Chardonnays that you'll get from up here in the Swan Valley, they're going to be much more 
sort of, they're going to have more tropical character to them. They're going to have more of that pineapple, more of the sort of ripe stone fruit. Um, and they might be a little bit more plush as well. Whereas down in Margaret River, um, they've got a much cooler climate. So you can get some herbaceous character to the, sh to the Chardonnays down there. More of an apple-y kind of note and lots of citrus as well. But they will generally do a bit of partial malolactic to convert that acidity as well. Um, but I think that's a wonderful question. I mean, there are some wineries around here that make Chardonnays from, um, from Swan Valley grown vines. Um, but generally, like, I think after like 2004, Chardonnay really sort of got the cut. It was mainly in the 90s when Chardonnay became incredibly unpopular. Um, but then after that, it started to have this lovely resurgence that we found. And like, obviously with ABC and Cardinet, like Kath and Kim, that kind of thing. Like, that's something that the market doesn't expect and we can't really compete with. But I think Chardonnay's back on a rise. I think, especially Swan Valley Chardonnays, you must give them a go. Margaret River, they've got their, they've got their crown support local, make sure you get more uh, Swan Valley Chardonnays. Now, thank you for that, Bryce. Now, let me have a little look. What else we got here? Oh, wonderful. Well, Daniel, definitely let us know when you try the kangaroo with the Chardonnay, how it goes. I mean, I'd probably recommend more of an age style, um, just because, yeah, just because it needs to really have that butteriness to offset the iron character that you get in the kangaroo steaks. So I think that would be a good call. Um, let's have a little look. Oh, hello, Tina. Thank you very much. Well, I look forward to seeing you as well in the cellar door. Honestly, we're hoping to throw in, yeah, we'll be very excited to do tastings again. And, like, we are gonna get back there. Like, it won't be long, and it's going to be even sweeter when we do. Let's have a little look. Well, that's a good sign. So, Laura, so Max Allen from the Australian didn't actually believe our Chardonnay fruit was from the Swan Valley. He thought it was so good that it was from Margaret River. That's just a testimony to these wines, and this little, just, this lovely little microclimate that we've got over here. So we're very lucky. Ah, very good. So for next week, now I thought I'd give you guys a nice little bit of heads up. So last week I announced that we had this week's um, Chardonnay tasting. Um, and then next week we're going to actually be doing a wonderful reserve Shiraz comparison. So we're going to be tasting our current release, one of our most awarded Shirazes, the 2016, and then the 2009 Reserve Shiraz. They are going to be exceptional. I urge you to come out and give them a go. Um, and that will be next week at the same time at 4 p.m. Um, please come along and watch this because, and I mean, you can't get Shiraz like you can from Upper Reach. It's so special. Mi the microclimate down there is so important to its flavor structure. So I do urge you to come along and, w and get your wines to have another little, have another little wine fest with me. <laughs> oh, thank you, Jeffrey. I'm sure you'll be back. Thank you, Jeff. Here we are. Ah, oh, perfect. Oh, I'm very glad that you guys are enjoying these tastings and once again we are going to be getting back to normal and I really hope that these live streams are yeah just making a nice little week well starting your weekend drinks very nicely and it's a fun little thing to get into as well like we miss everybody so much here at the cellar door um, we are still open we are still open seven days a week um, for takeaway wine sales and also if you want to have a beautiful walk around this stunning vineyard um, It's a great little walk. You can do one in about 15 20 minutes or you can do it as long as 40 minutes So come and get a map from the cellar door because we would love to see you and it would be a great change of scenery as well now 
A great little thing as well to mention, um, if, you, if you do get a chance, and I know it's a big ask as well, um, because none of us like doing reviews, but we really would appreciate some, some nice reviews online, like we're talking Google, TripAdvisor, it's what keeps our business going, and it what keeps me in a job anyway, and keeps me entertained with doing these kind of tastings. So we would really appreciate if you can hop on Google at some point and give us a little um, review and a little shout out, that would be amazing. Um, ooh. Also, if you're wanting to come for a little walk around the winery, you don't have to give us a heads up. Um, we're going to be open from 11.30 until 3.30 every day. Um, and pretty much, if you pop along at that time, we would love to see you guys. And yeah, if you do have any questions about the tour, feel free to give us a call. We would really love to hear from you. Oh, wow, thank you, Daniel. The best Shiraz he has ever tasted. That's wonderful. Marvellous, and we're seeing people on Monday. Oh, brilliant. We'll look forward to seeing you on Monday, Tina. That'll be great. But yeah, and just another reminder, guys, we are, like, we will be back to normal, like stay happy, it won't be long, and let's just have some fun and stay positive and happy. Um, yeah, and pretty much next week's wine tasting, all about Shiraz, so I am just over the moon about that. Um, and last week we did mention that we were going to look into doing an Instagram live feed as well. Honestly, like, we really want to do it, but it would be very tough to like reply to all the comments and everything. So we would love to do it, but yeah, come back to Facebook and we can enjoy it that way. Let's have a little look. Oh, fantastic, Vince. We will see you next week for the Reserve Shiraz tasting. That'll be great. And I think that wraps it up rather nicely. And like, with Mother's Day coming up as well, guys, we have a great hamper that's available online. It has all the wonderful treats that every mum needs. So we've got some sparkling, rosé. We have just a wonderful little care package that you can just get and it is, it's a wonderful little present. I can't remember off the top of my head how much it is, um, but pop on our Facebook, we put a post up about it, or on our website, you'll find it there. So thank you so much again, guys. Please tell your friends about these live tastings. We would really love to, we would really love to have more people joining us and more people asking questions. So I really hope next week, yeah, we'll see a lot more people. I mean, with the Reserve Shiraz, everyone's gonna be there. They love the Shiraz. So thank you so much again, guys. Happy hand washing and stay safe and happy. And I'll see you soon, very, very soon in the person. Thank you.